when a murder is discovered. She was in the bathtub where the killer had placed her. It just looked bad. It doesn't just destroy one life. I couldn't understand why. Why would somebody do such a terrible thing? It tears communities apart. You can still speak to residents now, and they say they've never got over it. What happened to a young man in the midst of their little community here? It's up to the police to not only solve the mystery. That was our hope, that where we were going was going to provide us with a treasure chest of information. And track down the killer, but bring them to justice. The absence of a head or hands in an investigation like this can impede identification, but it certainly doesn't make it impossible. In this episode, a 38-year-old woman goes missing, but is believed to have been killed. It was a massive shock, a real shock, I think, for a small city like Exeter to think that something like this could have happened. We deal with dead bodies all the time, well, however, not many are in this condition. Meet the murder detectives. What you have is a young lady who is in a suitcase which has been deposited on a railway embankment and covered over by twigs and other foliage. Who reveal how they caught the killer. It was DNA, it was phone analysis, it was forensics. Police brought an arsenal of investigative tools. The Cathedral City of Exeter in Devon lies on the picturesque River X and has been an important centre for the area since Roman times. On August the 8th, 2016, a seemingly routine report came in to Exeter Police Station. We were working on the evening that the uh, missing person report um, was passed to us to look at. Due to finish at 10 o'clock, and, and like a lot of police shifts, sometimes things don't go as you expect. You're never quite sure what's going to happen, what's going to come in, and it's one of those evenings, and something didn't look right from the outset. Detective Darren Webb and Deputy SIO Martin Sutcliffe picked up the case two days later. I was approached about a missing person called Gagana Prodnova and the fact that there were um, certain concerns and, and worries about whether or not it was simply a missing person inquiry um, or whether or not we had something more sinister. Martin and Darren were told the missing woman was a 38-year-old Bulgarian called Gagana Prodnova. She worked at a local hotel. Zenia Nikolova was a friend and colleague from the hotel. She shared a lot of things from her life before England, in general. She was pretty chatty. <laughs> Each morning when I go online to check on messages, if anything happened overnight, I got a message from her, which was really bizarre. Just reading it was so weird. It, there were so many things that doesn't match. And she was telling me that her mom passed away and everything happened so quickly, so she flew back to Bulgaria and she doesn't know when she's going to be back. The text message didn't ring true. When Gagana didn't turn up for work, Zenya tried to call and left several messages, but she didn't respond. We all start worrying. As on the movies, we just had to wait 72 hours and we phoned the police. Exeter is regarded by locals as a safe place to live. The case was treated seriously. This is coming into Exeter city centre. Crime levels are managed, I think, really well. There are challenges and there are areas of, of crime that always need to be looked at and, and addressed, but relatively, I would hope people would enjoy living in Devon and Cornwall. Anne-Marie also worked at a local hotel and had heard about Gagana's disappearance. You don't hear of things like that in Exeter. Very, very rare you hear of things like that. It's very safe. You can walk the streets of Exeter very safely, 10, 11 o'clock at night. It's a very nice place. When Martin took on the case, Gagana had been missing for four days. 
This is the major incident room at Exeter, and when a case breaks, like it did in, in um, Kagana's um, case, obviously, it requires an awful lot of, uh, of attention and a number of police resources, so they'd all converge in this room. They began a proof-of-life investigation, which looks at the missing person's lifestyle to see if there had been any recent abnormal activity. The vast majority of the information, particularly when you looked at a lady that had a lot of contact with people in Bulgaria and phone calls being made, all that had stopped, and this is a lady with three children. That in itself was extremely worrying. The team learned that Gagana's three children were being looked after by their father's family in Bulgaria while she was working in the UK. She said that financially they struggle in Bulgaria and the mother is uh, not very well, so they needed more money to, to cover bills and everything to take care of the family. So that's why she came over. Gagana had separated from her partner and had come to the UK. She had been in the country for less than eight months. We found Gagana to be nothing other than a, a very hard-working individual. Everybody would say that about her. She was very dedicated to her job. She would work hard. She loved her children and she loved her family. Gagana simply would not turn up to work. By this stage, she'd not turned up for a few days. So all these things obviously were of concern and were part of a consideration as to what we should then do. Martin began to trace Gagana's last movements. She had a boyfriend in Exeter, so he brought him to the station for questioning and asked him to confirm when he had last seen Gagana. The new partner gave a full and open account about their plans for that particular day. Gagana was going food shopping then planned to see her boyfriend to cook dinner for him, but she hadn't turned up. The first message he received was around the time that they were due to meet, and that message was certainly written in haste and littered with, with mistakes, and didn't seem to make sense to him at that time. Martin made a note of the strange message and checked out the boyfriend's story. Everything that he mentioned seemed to fall into place when he spoke to other people that had contact with Gagana. It looked like the boyfriend was not going to be able to provide any leads about Gagana's last 24 hours. The, the, the last person to see anybody alive is, is really significant in an investigation because they hold a lot of information. Devon and Cornwall CID had taken statements from Gagana's friends and colleagues, which revealed worrying information about her relationship with the father of her children, a man called costed in cost of. She suffered a lot in her life, like in the family, being abused physically, and her partner, I should say, he's been abusive like all their life together. Gagana and Kostov had been together for more than 15 years in Bulgaria, but she had left him to start a new life in Exeter. The general public tend to believe that um, abusive relationships evolves around um, primarily physical violence, whereas actually that's not the case. In a large amount of cases, it can be psychological, so where the perpetrator is controlling the victim through intimidation, coercion. Gaslighting, for example, is where the victim can be so convinced that they are in the wrong that their uh, perception of reality completely changes. The team discovered 42-year-old Kleiner Kostov was no longer living in Bulgaria. He had followed Gagana to the UK and moved himself into her tiny bedsit. He too was brought in for questioning. When Kostin Kostov was interviewed, what he was saying to police was, Gagana did come home, um, he remembers that. She was in possession of shopping. But what he went on to say was that she took a phone call when she was there. And when she took that phone call, demeanor changed, and she explained to him that her mother had died in Bulgaria, and so she needed to leave in order to sort out, obviously, that, that family matter. He also went on to say that he had given her 250 pounds in order to help her make her way. As with the boyfriend's story, 
the detectives thoroughly checked out Kostov's version of events. And we looked at financially, she was actually paid a lot better than he was. And when I looked at his means to give her that money, it didn't make any sense. That account didn't stack up and there were immediate suspicions about his involvement and disappearance. With Kostov already at the station being questioned, the team investigated his claim that Gagana had left for Bulgaria. Just looking into the timings, it wasn't possible for Gagana to get to the airport in the time that Kostadin was suggesting. Looking at her mobile phone records, seeing where text messages had been sent from, where was it at the time these messages were being sent. Those things suggested that Gagana's phone was in Exeter at the time where Kostov had said that she was on her way to the airport. It's not true, she was, uh, well, at least her mobile phone was in Exeter. They also contacted her family in Bulgaria. And we were able to ascertain really quite quickly, and with the help obviously of the Bulgarian community, her mother was still alive. Martin and the team looked at the evidence before them. Gagana had been reported missing four days ago, and the Proof of Life team had not been able to find any trace of her. Kostadin Kostov was lying about her last known movements. That's when a decision is made. He should be arrested on suspicion of Gagana Prodanova's murder. In August 2016, in Exeter Police Station, a missing person report about hotel worker Gagana Prodanova had now become something much more serious. One of the main shifts in the inquiry came from it moving, obviously, first of all, missing person, then to a, to a murder inquiry. A huge consideration was certainly the fact it was a no-body murder. Now officially a murder inquiry, Martin formed a team of officers. Head of forensics was Ivor Lloyd. Uh, after Costa was actually arrested, the Police and Criminal Evidence Act initially gives us 24 hours to investigate the crime. That meant there was great pressure on us to try and find something substantive forensically or Gagana or her body within that time before he had to be released. Ivor and the team's first port of call was the flat Gagana shared with Kostov in the hope it would reveal evidence of her life or death. It was a small flat, it must have been very difficult living there, especially with a former partner. Um, it was tidy, um, she was a hard-working lady. It didn't appear there had been much of disturbance, but of course it had been several days since the disappearance. Her suitcase is still there, her backpack is still there, toothbrush is still there. There was Bulgarian currency there. This was further evidence that Gagana hadn't left the country. But the flat didn't reveal the forensic clues Ivor was hoping for. There was certainly no evidence of any blood pattern in the, in the flat. What was there was the items Gagana had purchased in the shop on the night of her disappearance. As we looked at the natural route that Gagana would have taken, um, we became aware of the fact she stopped at a food store on the way home. The team found Gagana on CCTV at the shop. The ingredients she bought were in the flat, but the clothes she was wearing were not. It made it very, very suspicious. It was evident, unfortunately, that Gagana had probably come to a, a tragic end. Kostov had already been in custody for 24 hours, so the team had to apply to the magistrate's court for an extension to hold him longer without charge. If they didn't get it, Kostov would be released. The enormity of taking on an inquiry where there's no body can't really be understated. Um, all the inquiries you'd normally have to do obviously still exist, but you're also having to determine with absolute certainty and convince people that Gagana is no longer with us without having that physical evidence. The magistrate granted the extension. Martin had 48 hours left to prove Kostadin Kostov murdered Gagana. Her friends were in shock that Gagana had gone. My hopes were that he probably been so abusive to beat her up so she cannot just show up on the next day. But she didn't show up in a couple of days, right? Sorry. 
This is my hope. That she's gonna be all right. Just, just, just hiding. The press were now aware of the missing person investigation, and Martin and the team were hoping that the public might now help to build up a picture of Gagana's movements. There was an appeal to find Gagana. We were aware that a woman had gone missing, and as a news organisation, we helped as best we could. It's part of our role in these circumstances to help the police to find any information they can. We put out a picture, uh, there was CCTV of her final movements, and we did everything we could to try and attract the public's attention to see if Gagana could be found safe and well. We were under enormous pressure and had to work at full tilt in order to harvest as much as we possibly could. They already had strong circumstantial evidence, but each line of inquiry would have to be investigated in greater detail. The background of the domestic violence, the dynamic you've got, there is a motive, the lack of contact with the, the family. On top of that, you've got someone who is passing you false information about what has happened in the lead up to her disappearance. Martin put a large team on to trawl six days of CCTV for signs of Gagana or Kostov in Exeter. Digital media investigators analysed Kostov's phone and the proof of life team looked at Gagana's behaviour since her disappearance. So as far as proof of life was concerned, the one potential anomaly was the fact that there were messages going out from Gagana's phone after the time that we were quite sure that she was dead. Gagana's friend Zenya and her new boyfriend had both received messages on the night she disappeared. The message I got is on Cyrillic, which is our alphabet, and her phone doesn't have a Cyrillic. She always uses the English alphabet. The contact Gagana's boyfriend had with her on the night she disappeared was also unusual. The new partner talked about the fact that there was never a voice call, and he requested a voice call. You know, what is this message? Call me. That never happened. Head of forensics, Ivor Lloyd, had to keep all options open. Most of our attention was trying to identify where Gagana was, where her clothing was from the night that she was wearing, where any possible weapon might be. A laptop had been recovered from her flat, but her phone was missing. As we start to look at the phone, it hasn't travelled anywhere, not outside of the extra area. So we had a dedicated team that looked into that side of the inquiry. Through amazing diligence on their part, they were able to inform us that messages sent to both Gagana's boyfriend and work colleague Xenia had originated from or from the very close whereabouts of Kostov's flat. It was a revelation. That wasn't all. The digital media investigation revealed another vital piece of evidence. There was a SIM swap and there was a SIM card that was placed into Gagana's phone. And the work that was done by the inquiry team showed that we could attribute that SIM card to Kostin Kostov. Every photograph, every message that you send, it's all data that's available for an investigator. In this case, it was beneficial to the investigation because they were able to show where he was when the phone was being used. They were able to show that the SIM card had been changed over into a different phone. And the one conclusion is that he's actually killed her or he knows something about her death. Martin presented this to Kostov, who was in custody. Why is your SIM going into her handset? at a time that we believe that she's dead, or certainly missing, or you're trying to purport to us that she's in Bulgaria. So those key powerful questions were asked, and Kostin Kostov never ever gave a satisfactory answer as to why that was the case. As the investigation continued, Martin and the team learned more about Gagana's life with Kostov. She suffered all her life, gave birth of three kids, lovely, kids and left everything that she knows and everyone that she knows back home to go in a foreign country that she doesn't know anyone. 
for her to actually move her entire life here and try and start a life would have been an enormous challenge. Could be that she was fearful for her own life. Maybe she wanted to remove herself from a toxic situation for the benefit of her children. He was contrived, controlled and really callous. Uh, he spoke about Gagana like she was an object. What you have is an ex-partner who is controlling, abusive, who has come across to this country in order to seek a Ghana out, is aware of the fact that there is a new relationship. And in effect, what's happening is he's losing control of, of Gagana. And in domestic violence situations, it's a very dangerous dynamic. He would probably most likely be starting to feel very, very desperate. When coming to England and actually moving into her flat, he probably, to begin with, was very likely to start to evoke power and control over it all over again. And for her, that must have been quite devastating. Gagano's friends told police that from the moment Kostov had arrived in the UK, he had forced himself into her life. There was an incident after a barbecue that was held at the new partner's address where he broke up her phones and I think tore up a fair amount of her clothing. Once she'd seen that, a reminder of what she'd faced in her past, that was a key turning point where she wouldn't even consider going back and, and didn't even stay at that address anymore because she didn't want to be around Kostov and Kostov. The 72 hours were nearly up and they still hadn't found a body. But Martin never wavered in his belief. We were confident we'd prove that one Gagana had died, and secondly, that someone had taken on her identity after she died. Martin and the team presented their case to the Crown Prosecution Service, who would decide if there is enough evidence to charge. The CPS lawyer agreed with the police position. Kostadin Kostov was charged with the murder of Gagana Prodanova. We were aware that a suspect eventually had been arrested, but really we were on the, the outside looking in. When a major crime like that happens, Devon and Cornwall Police, the major crime investigation team, they keep things very close to their chest. Ivor Lloyd and his forensics team continued to search for Gagana's body member of the public that was travelling adjacent to a railway line in Exeter City Centre, smelt an unpleasant odour and reported it to the police. Ivor went to investigate. I arrived, parked up and instantly could smell something coming across the road actually from all the distance. I could see down there in the undergrowth sticks and twigs stacked up but unnaturally and cut as opposed to falling off trees and they appeared to be camouflaging something black and when I got closer I could see it appeared to be a roll along suitcase. From that suitcase I could see there was damage to it and there was some sort of fluid dripping from the suitcase and maggots coming out of the suitcase. Uh, it was extremely unpleasant. Could this be Gagana's body? left to rot in the undergrowth next to the railway line. Ivor and the team were about to find out. In the Devon city of Exeter, Kostadin Kostov had been charged with the murder of his ex-partner, Gagana Prodanova. Gagana had been missing for some period of time, and, and if our assessment was correct, dead for a considerable period of time. A suitcase had been found near the railway line, and there was a rotten smell in the air. Head of forensics Ivor Lloyd concluded it was coming from the case. I was fairly sure that something had died within the suitcase. Um, in the circumstances we had, I started to form the hypothesis that the body within the suitcase could very well be Gagana. Uh, at that stage, I didn't want to disturb anything, so I summoned uh, CSI to photograph the scene and record it as it was. I went down to the suitcase and I pulled the suitcase out of its ID hole, up onto a flatter part of ground uh, to see what we could see. Uh, I didn't want to open it here in the outdoors. I wanted it secured and controlled in a mortuary environment. 
driver informed Martin and the team back at HQ of what had been found. They were hoping the suitcase could answer a lot of questions. What can we determine about how she may have been killed? Um, which is why you then have, obviously, a forensic post-mortem dealt with by a Home Office pathologist who will go through in fine detail and try and give as many answers as they can in respect of what happened to, to the deceased. We deal with dead bodies all the time, obviously, by virtue of the job we do. However, thankfully, not many are in this advanced, decomposed condition. This was extremely trying for the team, very unpleasant notwithstanding the circumstances, but just actually uh, the state of the body itself. Many thousands of maggots were coming out of the body bag, uh, so it was quite a challenging post-mortem examination. So decomposition is a continuous process um, of varying stages that produce different scents, different chemical compounds, different gases. We break the continuous process of decomposition down into five stages, the latter two being advanced or post-decay and moving towards dry remains. The climate at that time and the temperature was high. Um, she's in effect in a microclimate within the suitcase and so deterioration is more rapid. Once we opened the case, we could quite clearly see what appeared to be a female's body in advanced stages of decomposition inside the case. Yeah, extended periods of decay and decomposition can inhibit the process of identification, but they don't impede it entirely. They certainly don't make it impossible. So from even um, dry remains, completely decomposed with no soft tissue, we can still look to establish things relating to the biological identity of the individuals. So in the end, the identification of Gagana to the body in the case was done through DNA. We looked at the toothbrush, which we retrieved from her home flat, and then we compared it to DNA from tissue from the body, and it indeed matched, and it was the Ghana. The police activity in the area had attracted a lot of attention, and the local community became aware of their discovery. A body had been discovered on a railway embankment in Exeter, that's when we first knew that an incident, a tragedy of some sort, had occurred. What we didn't know at that stage was the background. The team had found Gagana, but the lack of forensic evidence meant they couldn't link her body to their prime suspect, her ex, Kostov. What you have is a young lady who is in a suitcase which has been deposited on a railway embankment and covered over by twigs and other foliage how many cases of natural causes would end up with that scenario. The state of the body meant that the pathologist couldn't determine much else. We were left in a situation where actually we had no confirmed cause of death. We weren't able to say definitely how Gagana was killed or how she died. Having now identified Gagana, Martin and the team could now tell her family and friends that she was not missing. Most importantly, the family could have a Christian burial and could mourn their lost one in a way that they needed to. It's horrific, the news, but the, the position is then definite. We expected to hear that maybe, you know, she had gone off with someone or, you know, she was safe and well, but then to hear that you know, she had actually died. It was a real shock, a real, real shock. We sent reporters to the railway embankment, the, the road next to where the body was found, and we knocked on doors. It's part of the journalist's job to get as much information as you can. If you can't find anything concrete out about the actual incident itself, it's common practice to ask people in the street. And of course, they were worried, but the general reaction was one of, of puzzlement. Officers began searching through CCTV near the railway siding, hoping to see the suitcase being dumped, while Martin continued to search the area for physical evidence. When Gagana was found, she was naked, and so part of your consideration there is 
obviously wear, wear our Gagana's clothes. They could see the clothes Gagana had been wearing at the time she disappeared on the CCTV footage from the shop she was last seen in. We took a decision to recover what we could in the way of waste, domestic waste, in and around the area where we believe she went missing. What happens with a lot of investigations, sometimes you need a bit of luck. The investigators in this particular case took the opportunity to stop the bin collection and then collect all the bins up and then go and search through the many tons of rubbish. When you're going bag to bag, it takes a, a lot of determination and will to, to move through and keep your focus and concentration as it needs to be. Their breakthrough came when they found a bin bag that contained not just clothes, but shopping bags like the ones Gagana had been seen carrying. The actual bin bag, when they explored it, was open up and within that was a blue bag. Its appearance was remarkably good for a match for the shopping that she got from the Best One International store. The clothes were also a match to Gagana's. Finding the, the garments that were exactly the same as Gagana was wearing on the night she disappeared was brilliant. When the items were found uh, at the refuse tip uh, and photographed uh, and seized by CSIs, it became evident that they were all actually cut off the uh, victim when she was undressed rather than just being taken off. Within the same bin bag were other items they felt they could test for DNA evidence. There were cans located within that bin bag as well and a Jack Daniels bottle. So all of that potentially can, can harvest something for us. Kostov was still in custody, so police continued to search the flat he shared with Gagana. When suspects are brought in for questioning, under the Police and Criminal Evidence Act, samples are collected. So these things, in this case, like swabs, would have been taken to look for any kind of DNA, perhaps blood samples. I suspect that they were looking to be able to find a connection between the suspect and either the scene of the crime or the victim. In Kostov and Gagana's flat, officers found a pair of scissors. They, along with the cut clothes found in the rubbish bags, were sent for forensic examination. An assessment was made by a forensic scientist about whether those scissors made those cuts, and that came back positive. In addition to that, we looked at the garments for DNA. On the leggings, we found blood which was identified as coming from Costas. DNA tests were done on the beer cans found in the rubbish, again looking for a link with Kostov. Certainly the Carlsberg can was examined to see if the drinker, if you like, could be identified and again there was a full profile. A uh, huge moment, that was a point where I allowed myself to be at least slightly content with the way it was going. Martin and the team had now connected Kostov with Gagana's body. Officers examining CCTV of the area had also got a result. The suspect was identified dragging a roll-along suitcase in the early hours of the morning away from the Garner's home address and then for quite a short time later coming back without the case. The suitcase seems to be way above a weight which would ordinarily be involved when, um, well I don't know, some people like to pack particularly heavy but it was to the point of being ridiculous. They were convinced the man seen in the CCTV pulling the suitcase was Kostov and confronted him with the footage. He refused to admit this or accept it during an interview. With the CCTV and all the other evidence found at the flat, Martin and the team felt they had enough to go to court. You can't be 100% certain about how things are going to go. I mean, it really was one thing after another. There were so many different areas of evidence which showed it was categorically Kostov that committed this um, terrible crime. Everything pointed towards him. Thirty-eight-year-old Gagana Protonova had been found dead in a suitcase dumped near the railway line in Exeter, Devon. For months on end, myself, the case officer, 
and those at the core of the inquiry were basically working at full tilt, like a war of attrition, trying to get everything done. Um, and it was one of the most demanding periods I've ever had in my police career. The police had found CCTV footage that they believed showed Kostadin Kostov moving the suitcase containing Gagana's body from her flat to the railway siding. He's not dressed in his normal clothing. He wore a baseball cap, a very tight top, and tried to present physically in a different way to what he ordinarily would be seen on the CCTV. So we know that when Costin dumped Regana's body um, over the embankment, um, that he was caught on CCTV walking away, almost strutting and looking almost pleased with himself. I think what we have to remember is it's not necessarily the act of murder that he's feeling pleased about. It's the fact that he has, in his mind, been able to regain power. He's been able to regain control over her. They didn't consider it could be somebody else. Plus the fact the individual coincidentally walks the vast majority of the distance back to the home address of Kostin Kostov, all that obviously helps paint a picture of who may be responsible. With this video evidence, Kostov's DNA found on Gagana's abandoned clothes and proof Kostov had been using her phone, the police felt they had enough to try him for murder. So after months of preparation and getting the case together, obviously we moved to the trial phase, and this trial was held at Exeter Crown Court. On April the 20th, 2017, in Exeter Crown Court, the trial began. The murder trial in Exeter is a big event. It was an extraordinary case because there were two bombshell moments, the first being when the prosecution showed the CCTV of, of Kostov walking through the town in the dead of night with the suitcase with a body inside it. It's obviously a very unusual event that someone to choose to, to take their body through a city centre at all. I think there was an element of thought and planning around it because people walking through this city with suitcases is not that unusual an event. There are a huge number of the cameras available to us, which obviously are very useful when you're carrying out criminal investigations. When Kostov was confronted with the CCTV image of the man with the suitcase, his lawyers said that as no face was visible, it couldn't be proved it was Kostov. The way the police chose to prove that was to compare images of the defendant, Kostov, on other days as he's making his way to and from work in those locations through Exeter with images of this man with the baseball cap and the suitcase. And they actually brought a man into court who studied how people walked. This was gait analysis. He went into extreme detail about head movements, arm movements, torso movements, rotation of the knee movements. I mean, who knew these people existed? And the conclusion was that it was overwhelmingly likely that the man in the baseball cap was Costor. The police also presented their telephone evidence that showed that Kostov had sent text messages to Gagana's friends and family, pretending they were from her. Kostov made it quite clear, to me anyway, and I think to the court, that he was trying to portion blame elsewhere and was certainly looking towards the, the new partner that, that she had. So as he started to give his testimony and we started to talk about some of the messaging, he actually started to suggest that Gagana was involved in that, that she actually sent messages. Um, with a view to getting him in trouble. The only trouble in this investigation uh, was that he was going to be arrested for her murder. He did try and suggest that whilst at the flat, it must have been Gagana or another that were actually sending messages. When the prosecution said, how on earth do you expect us to believe that it was Gagana sending these messages? He was the person sending them all along, it was obvious. And to suggest that Gagana was still alive sending messages in her name was ridiculous, to be honest. After the prosecution had laid out their case, Kostov himself gave evidence in his defence. 
It's always a high point of a trial when the defendant gives his evidence because you know very quickly after he opens his mouth and answers these allegations whether or not he's got a case or not. The way he spoke in there, on occasions he actually he broke into a smile and a laugh whilst being questioned. That's a person that you're dealing with. That's unbelievable. There was an arrogance there. Did he think he could pull this off? Some people have that narcissistic type of personality where they think, I'm the smartest individual in the room. I will work my way through this. I've done it before, I'll do it again. He just would not budge from his view that it must be somebody else that he did it. He always seemed to portray that he was a victim somehow of, of this entire scenario and that everything was Gagana's fault. By tracking Kostov's phone and those movements with the CCTV footage, police showed he had returned to the suitcase some days after it was dumped. It was explained that Kostov had returned to the scene of where the suitcase was and he'd made this search on his phone using the Bing search engine. The most powerful piece of evidence, arguably, and, and the impact you could see it had in the court came from the, the Bing search that was conducted by him on his mobile phone. How long does it take? for a human corpse to decompose. Lord knows what he was thinking when he made this search because the police, when they went back to examine the evidence, could clearly look at his search history because he was at the scene where the body was. He was standing literally metres away from where Gagana was decomposing in a suitcase. So why would you make that search? Well, you can imagine how explosive or damning that is as, as a piece of evidence when the jury hear that. The court case took five weeks. In the end, it was down to the jury to decide whether Kostov was guilty of the murder of Gagana. One of the challenges is that you almost have to be able to demonstrate how somebody died. Gagana's body was found in a suitcase, so it was quite clear that it wasn't natural. You know, so the, the, that in itself helped. They can't say that it's a murder because there's no sign of violence, but by the same token, is it an accident? It's quite clear she was murdered. It's quite clear that she was put into a suitcase and transported to that location, to the deposition site. It probably wasn't as big an issue because of those reasons that they, they couldn't establish how she died. So I was there for the duration of the trial. Trials are always very nerve wracking experiences. I think he, he possibly did think he could get away with it. I don't think he had any sense of the reality of standing in a witness stand in the UK trying to prove yourself to a jury of 12 men and women when you're faced with such a compelling case. At every stage when the prosecution presented its evidence, he was simply moving a step closer to the prison cell. Once all the evidence had been heard, the judge sent the jury out to consider their verdict. It's almost like you take a breath. The dynamic has changed. You've gone through, you've done everything you possibly can. I've sat through hundreds of trials and you never know until that verdict comes whether or not the jury sees the case in the way that you see it. A person's liberty is at stake here. Everything has to be taken seriously. So when the verdict is delivered, it is high drama. It's pure theater in a sense. Under 90 minutes later, they came back into court and were unanimous in a guilty verdict. It really was such a strong case. And so the relief is even greater because it would just be a horrendous miscarriage of justice if he was able to walk the streets knowing what we knew about him um, in the fullness of Kostadin's, Kostov's character. It, it just wouldn't have been right for any other verdict other than murder and guilty. The motive for this case was as old as the hills, it was jealousy. If he couldn't have her, obviously no one else could. And that's the unfortunate thing. But he's in the right place and I think we all feel a lot safer that he is there. And maybe people will learn something from this case, let's say it. People should not accept abuse, mental or physical abuse, you should change it, immediately cut it off. Don't wait for something bad to happen.